I love to, what I say, float when I walk because the fabric is blowing in the wind and it just makes me feel beautiful. We are in the Pierre Hotel where I came in on a meeting with Irving Penn and Italian Vogue and I started working immediately. Once I signed my contract with Clairol back in the late 70s, I was on their hair color box, Born Beautiful. My color was dark auburn, box 512. It was exciting because I saw my face in drugstores everywhere and my work started picking up more and more. When I was 18, I graduated from high school. My mom, she was very excited for me. That's when I proceeded to tell her my truth. My mother, being a mother, of course she knew, and what she did was open up her arms, told me she loved me, and supported me throughout my entire life. Back in the 70s, it was a different world, especially for transgender women, because I was working as a female model. For me, personally, I had to hide my truth because if I was to tell, I'm sure that I would get fired. But that day came. I started working also for a magazine. I was on the set. Suddenly, someone came in the door and that person called the editor over to him and they had a conversation. It just started feeling very negative. She decided to close the set and send everybody home. And that was the day that um, my truth was revealed. And um, yeah, my work stopped right after that. A few months ago, I received a phone call. The person on the other line wanted me to come in to meet some clients for a job. They were from Clairol, and they were interested in bringing me back. And at the time, I just had so many different emotions going through me. I was being accepted for who I was, and they wanted me to come back as that person and not be something other than what I what I truly am, a woman of color, of course. <laughs> the nice and easy color that I'm using today is 6N by Clairol. It seems to soften my features, which I absolutely love. Don't be afraid to live your truth. And if an opportunity knocks, go for it. It's good to be back and it's really good to be me. Growing up, I didn't even know what trans was. It was always, you're not a girl. You're not a girl. You're not a girl. Black trans woman from Trinidad Tobago, that doesn't go over well. I did not see a future for myself. Going through life growing up, when it came to understanding my truth. I was so excited about my truth that I thought that everyone should just be like, we accept you, we love you, blah, 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 blah. For my mother, who is rooted in her church, in, in her Bible, she did not understand it. My name is Carol, and Dominique is my son. My, sorry, is my daughter. My first born. When I got to a certain age, it was no longer cute for me to do the girly things. Now it was like, look, this can be kind of serious. I had an aunt who, every time I opened my mouth, she would say, speak like a boy, act like a boy. You're not a girl. OK, but this is where I relate. I remember first asking the question, what is this? Why is it here? To them, it was like, you're born male. But to me, it was like, this isn't right, so somebody fix it. Religion was always a part of my life. But religion also hurt me. At those times, I didn't feel like I had any connection to God. Even though I knew he was there, I just didn't feel like he loved me or cared for me because I was told that I was an abomination for being myself. By age 15, Dominique had experienced enough fear and abuse to last a lifetime. 
Now, she'd leave the only home she'd ever known, seeking the one thing she needed the most, family. Dominique's initiation into the world of ballroom helped her define what she'd always been feeling. It also provided sanctuary to live openly as the person she saw in the mirror. When she came into my life, it must have been like 97, 98, Dominique didn't have her green card, couldn't work as much, and she was living from post to post, pillar to pillar, sleeping on different people's couches. In my head, I could just still picture everyone, like, on the pier, voguing and reading, and that was our place. You would stay down on the pier, and you had community, you had family. As soon as you said, I'm sleeping on the pier, someone would say, oh, well, I got a wealthier apartment, so you could come over, stay, and, like, you're going to be my sister. When a ballroom person calls you mother, brother, sister, uncle, auntie, it's deep. The camaraderie and the acknowledgement kind of negates the fact that you're sleeping on the floor. So, so it's shared. It's very communal. Yeah, it's very communal. And that's the thing about it. People didn't think, like, how could you be hanging out in the street and homeless and be happy? And it was like you had people that went through the same thing with you and we were there for each other. I guess we distracted each other from the... From all the pain and stuff. Yeah. And then say that we're sick. We're crazy, and some of them think that we are the most gorgeous, special things on earth. I would like to be a spoiled, white, rich white girl. <laughs> they get what they want whenever they want it, and they don't have to really struggle with finances and nice things and nice clothes, and they don't have to have that as a problem. I don't feel that there's anything mannish about me, except maybe what I might have between me down there, <laughs> which is my little personal thing. So I guess that's why I want my sex change, to make myself complete. I was about 13, 14 years old, and I used to do it behind my family's back, just dressing up. So finally, they caught on with it. And I didn't want to embarrass them, so that's when I moved away. I moved to New York, and I continued doing it. They saw me, and they all liked me, all the rest of the extravaganzas. And they decided, well, if you want to become an extravaganza, you have to walk a ball first, and if you snatch a trophy, then you become the extravaganza. That's how it's supposed to work with any, everyone. But uh, like that, it wasn't with me. I just became an extravaganza. Hector Extravaganza, he's the one who started the house. He was the first gay man I ever met. The first time he took me to the village, which was my birthday, I had just turned 15 years old, and he threw a party for me. Out there, he bought me a cake. I met a lot of drag queens, transvestites, that I didn't believe were because they were so beautiful. And that kind of sunk into my head. And I guess that's why it kind of made me want to even do it more. Now you want to talk about reading? Let's talk about reading. What is wrong with you, Pedro? Are you going through it? You're going through some kind of psychological change in your life? She went back to be a man. Oh, you went back to being a man. Touch this skin, darling. <laughs> Touch this skin, honey. Touch all of this skin, OK? You just can't take it. You're just an overgrown orangutan. The thing that helped me make my most money through the escort service is being that I'm so little, I'm so petite, I'm tiny, um, the blonde hair and the light skin, and the green eyes and the little features. And the client's hands will be bigger than my hands while they would hold my hand or something. You know, they like feeling that there was something perfect and little, and not someone that's bigger than them, because I guess that kind of disturbs them. Most all the drag queens that are involved in the ball, say 90% of them are hustlers. I guess that's how they make their money, to go to the balls and get whatever they need and stuff. I used to hustle in New York to make my money. I was with a guy, and 
He was playing with my titties till he touched me down there. He felt it and he seen it and he like totally flipped out. He said, you fucking faggot. You're a freak. You're a victim of AIDS and you're trying to give me AIDS. What are you, crazy? You're a homo. I should kill you. You know, stuff like that. And like I was really terrified. So I just jumped out the window. I grabbed my bag and just jumped out the window. But see, now I don't like to hustle anymore. I don't. And I'm afraid of what's going on, the AIDS, and I don't want to catch it. But later on this evening, I'm supposed to meet someone, a friend of mine, a very good old friend of mine. He's a young, very good, attractive, handsome young man. And um, he's taking me out to dinner later on this evening, or for cocktails after midnight. I know he'll give me some money just for me to maybe buy a pair of shoes and a nice dress so that the next time he sees me, he'll see me looking more and more beautiful the way he wants to see me. But I don't have to go to bed with them or anything like that. At times, they do expect sexual favors, but that is between myself and them, so I do not wish to further speak about that, if they do. But at most times, 99% of the time, they don't. 95% of the time, they don't. But I feel like... Oh, you should have seen me have history. If you're married, a woman in a suburb, a regular woman, is married to her husband, and she wants him to buy her a washer and dryer set. In order for him to buy that, I'm sure she'd have to go to bed with him anyway to give him what he wants, for her to get what she wants. So, in the long run, it all ends up the same way. I want a car. I want to be with the man I love. I want a nice home away from New York, up the peak skills, or maybe in Florida, somewhere far where no one knows me. I want my sex change. I want to get married in church in white. I want to be a complete woman. And I want to be a professional model behind cameras in a high fashion world. I want this. This is what I want. And I'm going to go for it. I always used to tell her, Venus, you take too many chances, you're too wild with people in the streets, something is going to happen to you, but that was Venus. She always took a chance, she always went into a stranger's car, she always did what she wanted to get what she wanted. I had a booking for a Christmas show at Sally's, and the DTs came to me with a picture of her murdered, and they were about to cremate her because nobody had came to um, verify the body, and... I was the one that had to give all this information down to her family. Actually, they found her dead after four days, strangled under a bed in a sleazy hotel in New York City. I'm hungry. We used to get dressed together, call each other, and say what we were going to wear. And, you know, she was like my right hand. As far as I'm concerned, I miss her. Every time I go anywhere, I miss her. That was my main... the main daughter of my house, in other words. But that's part of life as far as being a transsexual in New York City and surviving. Let me try and show you how we get some of these sounds. First of all, none of them exist as a particular sound as they would on an electronic organ. There's no magic button marked trumpet or violin or drums. You have to build every sound. And to start to build these sounds, you have to start with something pretty simple. And here are the simple things we start with. There are five of them. The simplest one of all is something that any lab technician must have seen at one time or another. It's called a sine wave. It's very smooth, very flute-like. A little bit more complicated wave is called sawtooth. And it's called sawtooth because on an oscilloscope, oscilloscope screen, it looks just like a sawtooth. And uh, this one is a little richer, a little reedier, and it resembles a lot of sounds found on home electronic organs. 
something in between those last two, and a very useful sound indeed, is something called triangular, and it's kind of a pointed sine wave. So you can see it's a little brighter than a sine wave. Um, this one's called pulse wave, and I'm just going to show you how it swings into a thing called square wave. It's uh, up, down, up, down, just like a switch. If you flip a switch, you're making a pulse wave. If it's an even off, on, off, on, then it looks on an oscilloscope very symmetrical, and it's called a square wave. And if I take the time that it's on and make it different from the time that it's off, it changes quality. Listen to it. It shifts in Terry. It's a very useful sound. The last of which uh, is probably the least useful, although you'd never want to be without it. It's very colorful, very coloristic. In its pure form, it sounds like surf or a steam sound. It's called white noise. Now I'll patch this up here into one of my output modules and um, try and show you how with these primitive sounds we start to get some very musical sounding things. First of all, here's a sawtooth wave that's coming out of an oscillator, going into a mixer, coming up into a, what's called a filter, which is going to remove parts of the sound, either the top or the bottom part, much like bass and treble controls do on your you know, high fidelity system. And uh, by hitting a note on the keyboard now, I'm connected up so I'll hear that one sound. It's a very low sound. It's very bright. If I manually turn this knob, you'll listen to the sound get considerably duller. Here, it gets very dull down here. It's very bright here. Instead of doing this manually, I can do it automatically with what's called an envelope generator. It generates the envelope, the envelope being this type of motion that I'm shaping the tone with. So I'll do it this way. And that can be speeded up till we almost start hearing a plucked string. If we turn that around and make it uh, open up instead of closing, it does this, which was quite a surprise when I first heard it. It has almost a trumpet-like quality or trombone quality in this range. Let's uh, show you how one of these sounds might be laid in to a piece. Okay, we're in tune. Everything sounds like it's about right. I'll start the A track, and you'll hear all the other components of the score, and I'll add in the solo. important collaborator back then in the early days was Wendy Carlos and out of uh, those experiments came Switched On Bach of course which uh, then became the largest selling classical album of all time. The forces that went into the background of Switched On Bach were really based on something that happens every so often in, in history. It was a magical moment when the timing was right. Before 1968 the conventional wisdom in the music business not the musical instrument industry, but the music business, was that sure you could make funny sounds with electronics and you could do weird things, but you couldn't make real music. What was real music? Real music was uh, music that made real money. But Wendy Carlos uh, proved that wrong, she, uh, no uncertain terms. Bach seemed to be an ideal uh, uh, type of music to use because the multi-track tape recorder allows you to lay down one melodic line on top of another to form chords and, you know, all of the orchestrational things that one wishes to have and the um, the synthesizer itself at that time don't forget was one note at a time and since you could only do one note at a time and since most of Bach's music is one note at a time it was like the perfect marriage of um, the right technology the right techniques and typically when Wendy and I got together she would tell me what we did wrong she would tell me what she would, what she would like to see us do and we would go back and do it, and uh, sometimes it took three or four times before we got it the way she liked it. He was the engineer who spoke music, I was the musician who spoke engineering terms, and together we were able to come up with ideas that I don't think anyone would have come up with alone.
synthesizer is a device that makes a whole something, a whole sound or a whole piece of music out of component parts. And that's the way a musician thinks of a synthesizer. As this part changes the tone color, this part is the pitches, this part is the articulation, and so on. So when a musician works with the patch chords and sets the knobs, he is synthesizing a sound. Well, synthesizer, I've got my cake and eat it too. You see, I still have the same sounds that I had back when I was working with the Moog synthesizer. Remember the sine wave? We still have that. We also can do a very percussive one, one that's sort of a little more refined than we're able to do with the Moog synthesizer. From the same notes, listen to this one. And again. That last one is very quiet. Let's put those three together. And at the attack, let's add a little bit of noise. Now what we have here is a replica of the xylophone, and that's a sound that I never was able to get with the old synthesizer. Equal tempered scale, you know, it's the one that Grandma's piano was tuned to. It's the one we were all grown up to think of as being sort of sacrosanct or God-given, and uh, you know what it sounds like, and you can play in any key. They all sound equally as good or equally as bad. Now I say equally as bad is the reason is that these are compromises. They're mathematical compromises to allow the ability to change key to modulate. Uh, but it's not designed to make all of the keys sound as good as they could sound. Now uh, let's show you what they could sound like. The equal tempered scale playing this chord is very rough, a little dissonant. If I retune it, by playing, in this case, I'm uh, using this auxiliary keyboard that I built, which is triggering a Hewlett Packard computer running a piece of software that I wrote. It's retuned the whole instrument now. Notice how much smoother that is than the equal tempered scale. Now we have large scale integration, we have computers, uh, we, we have sophisticated software. Musicians are using all of it, they're using it as fast as, as can be developed. I think that computers and the software that's written for them are going to be the greatest thing for musicians since the invention of catgut itself. Carlos has used her innovative tunings, timbres, and timings for the hauntingly lyrical Beauty and the Beast. of music as has never occurred before even with mom spin it in the uh, living room um, that was something where very few of these uh, of the children might learn how to play piano but an awful lot of us are now going to be able to learn with our computers and with our keyboards how to play music the more they'll be able to have an appetite for delicacies uh, uh, for their sushi for their Middle Eastern dishes for things that they hadn't tried before their appetites will be broadened and they'll be able to understand and love uh, a deeper range of real masterpieces in the future. In fact, uh, the technologies are moving very far forward. And a lot of the music, which I may belittle as being a little bit plastic fantastic, you know, the commercial types of uses of this, which don't have any imagination, which don't use the new tunings, which are doing just the sort of the sampling kind of easy things to do, which aren't getting to the nitty gritty. Nonetheless, they are sponsoring an industry which slowly is broadening its horizons, maybe kicking and screaming all the way. But it's moving forward and it's going to happen. It'll be happening before the end of this millennia is out, we'll be able to then do any kind of possible music without really thinking about the, the, the hardware, and it will then be the composer, the musician that comes, won't be the technology. Thank you. 
Marsha P. Johnson is remembered as an activist and free spirit, with flowers or Christmas lights in her hair, and said to be one of the first rioters at Stonewall in 1969. Before the term transgender entered the lexicon, Marsha called herself a transvestite or a drag queen. When I became a drag queen, I started to live my life as a woman. During her life, she and other trans activists struggled to be fully accepted in the gay community, which often excluded trans people. Marsha was often homeless, supporting herself through sex work and repeatedly arrested. But she attracted many friends to help her. A fellow activist once saw Marsha asleep under a table of lilies at a flower shop. The employees welcomed her because they thought she was holy. Once a judge asked Marsha what the P in her name stood for. She explained. Pay no mind Johnson. Marsha pay no mind Johnson. The judge, charmed, said, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. <coughs> she was released. She was well known in New York's Greenwich Village, where she became an icon after the Stonewall Riots. I was one of the first girls to ever come in drag to the Stonewall. 1969 when the Stonewall Riots started, that's when I started my rioting. As one story recounts, during the riots, Marsha threw a shot glass into a mirror at the bar after police entered, shouting, I got my civil rights. Marsha was a founding member of the Gay Liberation Front and she formed STAR in 1970 with Sylvia Rivera, a transgender woman and activist. It was revolutionary in its direct support for the trans community. Together, they opened STAR House, a shelter for homeless LGBTQ youth. She was also an advocate for those affected by HIV and AIDS and rejected the stigma and shame associated with the virus. I think you should stand as close to them as you can and help out as much as you can. Including myself, I have HIV. She remained devoted to her Christian faith throughout her life. Friends say she could be found praying in various churches, at times dressed in velvet, throwing glitter. Marsha died in 1992 at the age of 46. At the time, police said she had taken her own life, a claim friends disputed. I mean, it's hard for me to believe that she would commit suicide. The case was reopened in 2012 as a possible homicide. Like Marsha, trans women continue to suffer from long-standing discrimination and violence. Her legacy reflects the ongoing struggle for transgender people to be safe and receive equal rights. People to realize that we're all brothers and sisters and human beings in the human race. Okay, let's look at them one at a time. Our first finalist we're going to look at from Boston, Miss Sonia. Let her have a good look at you, Miss Sonia. Our second finalist from Philadelphia, Miss Harlow. Our third finalist from New Jersey, Miss Emery. Our fourth finalist from Chicago, Miss Alfonso. And our fifth finalist from Manhattan, Miss Crystal. We are going to give you all and the judges a closer look at them. Okay, Crystal, you start it. Walk right down into the center aisle and pose halfway up the runway. I'm just a woman. A lonely woman waiting on the weary shore. I'm just a woman that's only human, one you should be sorry for. Woke up this morning along about town without a warning. I found he was gone. Why did he do it? How 
how pretty it is. That's wonderful, darling. Come on back. He never died before. Am I blue? Am I blue? This is the moment we've all been waiting for. It looks like Joey has the final judge's decision. Here's our fourth runner-up, Miss Alfonso from Chicago. Let's hear it for her, ladies and gentlemen. Our third runner-up in the 1967 Nationals from Manhattan, Miss Crystal, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for her. The third runner-up in the 1967 Nationals. Okay, now we're down to the real nitty-gritty. And here are our three finalists. Come on, kids. Come on up here to the front of the stage and let the audience have a good look at you. Crystal, where are you going? This is not the time to show temperament. Get back here and stay with the other finalists. Oh, well, you've got to expect more. Okay, we've got to continue with the business at hand. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the name of the second runner-up of the 1967 Nationals, Miss Sonia from Boston, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for her. Miss Sonia, second runner-up of the 1967 Nationals. We're now at the point for which everyone has been waiting. Ladies and gentlemen, there can only be one queen, one reigning queen. That's unfortunate. Each one of these marvelous contestants was certainly a winner in his own right. But here is the only winner in the 1967 Nationals, that queen which will reign over America. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Queen of the 1967 Irish.
She is not beautiful, has no qualifications, and she's body black. Did you think she deserved it? Darling, she didn't deserve it. Answer me. You're not speaking from the damn camera. You have a mind. Do you think she deserved it? You know she didn't deserve it. All of them, the judges knew it too. But she was terrible. No, she And her explanation for why she wanted the money to put it in the bank. <laughs> She's not getting any money because Sabrina is not going to pay her. They're good friends. It's only publicity, and it's bad publicity for Hall and all the rest because I'm and declared as one of the ugliest people of the world. And next time she should drop and the outfit off at the cleaners before York, she wears darling. it on stage. She better get the hell back to Philadelphia, the Philadelphia because she's the one of the, the worst. The and where's Miss Sabrina? Because I'll sue the bitch. Did you sign I will sue. No, I didn't sign any release. And if she releases anything, it's anything bitch on me. Anything. 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 Anybody but her. You can take all the pictures you want of me, but I better not see them on the street because it's over. Um, get a picture with me and Harlow and we'll see which is more beautiful, darling. The judges didn't have any taste. It was with you that the judges was with, darling. You were in it. It was all week, two weeks. Monique told me not to come. That's why Monique is not here in dress because she's one of the... Monique, darling. Monique was not here as a friend of yours. She's a friend of mine, darling. Monique, would you tell her why you didn't come? Because she knew it's Victor Holler. She said, Crystal, darling, don't go. Because you're not going to get it. And that's why all the true beauties didn't come. It's in bad taste and you're showing your colors and shit. I am, I am doing it bad, but I got a, I have a right to show my color, darling. I am beautiful and I know I'm beautiful. Don't talk about she's showing no color. May I say this to you? Taking the wrong way. Shit, she looked bad. And no way of what you say can do about it. Look at Harlow's outfit. That is crazy. Don't bother her. Don't bother her. It's not Harlow's fault. It's not her fault. I know it's not her fault. Harlow has that. She can't help it. Because you're beautiful and you're young. You deserve to have the best in life. But you didn't deserve. Miss see, I, I don't say she's not beautiful, but she wasn't looking beautiful tonight. She doesn't equal me. Look at her makeup. It's terrible. And, and, and did you, wait a minute, did you complain to the judges? No, I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking really. Why don't you show justice look at, and look at them. Them. But they told me, Sabrina, that you had it fixed for Harlow. Everyone knew about you having it fixed for Harlow for weeks and weeks ahead. Now, we listened to you. I listened to every word you had to say. Now, wait a second. Hold it.
There's a party after here. Every one of the judges is going to be there. You may feel perfectly free. I'll catch over myself, and you can talk to each one of them. Most of those people I never saw before in my life. I don't know them. I went down to the Dom one... Wait a second, dear, you listen to me. I went down to the Dom one night, trying to influence Mr. Warhol to come up here as a judge. We sat down there for two hours and couldn't even get an audience with Andy Warhol. He's running around his factory making a movie or something. Oh, we have to open the door. Everybody goes out. I jump in. What did you say? Why, Everybody go out. Yeah. Everybody go outside. Everybody go outside. Show us all the quarters. Go out. We're going out right now. Okay. Everybody out. Let's go. Let's go. You know, that's not bad. Nothing. Oh. <laughs> want to get out of here. It's Gigi. We felt really compelled to share Kate's story, help him with his transition. We were on my book tour last year, so we weren't at the top of his trip, but we met him in San Francisco, which is where he got his surgery. Without further ado, let's just get into it. Let's bring Kate into here. So. Oh, your head! So. Attention! <laughs> Here is Cade. Hi. I think it would be interesting for people to know how we met. We were at brunch together. Drag brunch. We were at drag brunch and someone was like, oh my god, you should do Gigi's makeup. And we were both like, okay. And then I came over here and painted you in drag. Into the drag fantasy that is McLaren, and which then, is my drag name. And then we went to Mickey's and the rest is her story, I feel. Like, her. We just click. <laughs> yeah, I just like fell in love with you guys and you guys made everything really easy and I was like, oh, I never need to leave this house again. <laughs> what ended up happening was Cade got top surgery. Yes. Which is like gender confirming surgery, right? Mm -hmm. How long did you know you wanted that done for? I have wanted that for so long, literally. I think even when I was like in middle school and stuff, I just never liked having them out really. And I just like wasn't into it. And then I started binding like on and off since I was like 18. I started hormones and things like started to change. I was like, okay, this, this feels right. This has to go. So you were always kind of like triggered by it. You always had like yeah. a little thing. Yeah. Even when I didn't really know like my gender situation yet, I was like, this isn't it though. So morning of Leaving for San Francisco, yeah. you and Hutch are on the road. Oh my gosh, I was so excited. Hutch is usually the one that's kind of like, okay, time to go, like, let's go. And I was like, wake up, like, let's go. And we were like, I was just so excited. It was Thanksgiving when me and G told you that we wanted to help with the surge, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, like a f ton of, like, anticipation, like, so excited. Yeah. We all were. Obviously, you were the one that was going into <laughs> surgery and, like, having this, like, life-altering moment. But, like, literally everyone was just, like, so excited for you because, like, to see something that, like, is a part of our, like, chosen family, somebody that we love, like, going through, like, such a confirmation and such, like, a milestone was, like, insane. The morning of your consultation, you hadn't met the doctor, which yeah. is something I feel like a lot of trans people go through because there are so few doctors who specialize yeah. in chest surgery and top surgery. A lot of people have to meet with their doctor on Skype and then travel to the doctors. I don't even know what I was expecting, but we went in and he does that surgery literally every day, probably a billion times a day. And he was very like, okay, worked so easy. Like looked at my chest and was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, killing it. We'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, that's it? Yes, it was so easy like that. And I was like, no. The morning of surgery, I was so excited, and they actually called me, and they were like, hey, we had a cancellation or whatever, do you want to come in right now? And it was 6 a.m., and I was like, 
hell yes. And then we just sprinted down the San Francisco hills and got to surgery. <laughs> Walking into the surgery room, I was really overall so excited, but I was just kind of in the long run being like, oh my gosh, I hope he kills it. Like, I hope I have like- Pancake the, chest, yeah, no like, nipple. I just wanted the aesthetics to be so gorge about it. And so I was, I feel like that's the only reason I was kind of nervous, but the rest I was so excited. And the Valium was- Up kicking. <laughs> yes. Nerves are gone. <laughs> Looking good. Feeling gorgeous. I'm so excited. I'll have to have take a try. I have trained artistries. I'm tired as <laughs> You look tired and high. I am both of those for sure. Nats and Gigi are coming. They're texting me the cutest, nicest things ever. So it's just going to be good vibes. It's going to be super fun. And I'm really excited. No tits ever again. Yay. Okay, well, love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Oh my highness. I was definitely very persistent about taking my pain meds at the exact moments. Like I woke up in the middle of the night every like three hours to take a pain pills because I did not want to feel pain. These angels were celebrating Gigi's birthday. So it was like, <sighs> Very happy, amazing vibes all around me at yeah, all times. Definitely like, energetic. <laughs> I was either full pass out napping or like watching them like dance on pool tables. Like it was literally just one or the other. So it was just an amazing. <laughs> yeah, no, time. I know that this was like supposed to be like downtime and like surgery but, recovery yeah, time. But we had to turn yeah, up. It was end of book tour and, and my birthday. birthday. And my mom flew out. Like, yes, it, it was, was everything. We had to party just a little bit. Yes, and so it was. And if I was like wanting to be in the middle of it, like not would literally stand in front of me. Good morning. Good morning. It's Gigi's birthday. She woke up and changed my drains for me for her e birthday. Yes. <laughs> Drained Angel. And now we're face tuning a golden birthday selfie. But yeah, we're gonna have the best birthday ever in San Fran. Gigi's the bestest friend in the world. She literally sending her birthday here because I got searched here. Like, who is she? I can't. Like, Ride or die for the BFF and for the surge angel. <laughs> I understand like, the that's struggle. That's the cutest ever. I feel like the only F to M guys I've ever met in my life are very the type of guys that would be like, I can just do this like on my own type vibe or like as long as I have someone picking me up, I can just like chill at home. Like when like, if I didn't have you guys, I wouldn't even know what I would have done. You can't even lift your arms up for three months. And so when it actually is, your pain colored out and it hurts. Like you literally can't do anything for like a week at least. So yeah. if I didn't have like a solid amount of people, I definitely would have been. <laughs> I don't even know what I would have done. And of course I had to injure my hand that oh, night. My. It's his rest recover moment and I have to get hurt and make it about me yeah. a little bit. <laughs> that what was very traumatic. Hurt? I what smashed a bottle on top of your beer. Oh yeah. Like and trying I to still do that like have, Joe. Yeah, you trying know? to fuck up my drink in my day. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? We can laugh about it now. Yeah. It yeah. Was, but it moment, was the end of the world chaos. to me. No, yeah. I, like, yeah. seeing you in pain and hurt is, like, the worst experience of my life. So, like, you just looking up at me and your hand's, like, gushing, gushing blood. blood. I, like, instantly start sobbing. Gigi it starts crying. I'm screaming. Else. Kate is, like, waddling, like... At the doctor's office, morning of getting your bandages off, I remember seeing it for the first time and literally being floored. I couldn't believe it, and I was like trying to reassure him so much because you were really nervous. Yeah, I didn't want them to see. I didn't want me to see. I was like freaking out. I was and the like, doctor's no, like, like usually people are excited yeah. to see. You're like, I don't want to. I, I, I was like, it. I can't see it. <laughs> I can't look at it. It's like that show, The Swine. Look how flat you are. I can't even see it. It's a fucking pancake. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> it just looks so good. I'm so happy. Everyone's here. Everyone? Yeah. Look at it! <sighs> I'm home. Are you yeah. dead? <laughs> I know. How good is it? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Sorry. We're super, super excited. How are you doing? Hi. What an entourage you have. I just have the best friends in the world. I love you guys so much. This is fucked up. Those are like the best scars that I've ever seen. Yeah, those are the best scars I've ever seen. I'm gonna cry. Yeah, they're really good. I love you. They're super good. It's so weird because I always watch people's like reactions and they're like crying and I just didn't, but I just felt like, it was like, oh my God, finally, mm -hmm. like work now. It's just like what I always in my brain think I had.
Because, like, I would literally, like, go out without a binder before or something, and then I'd be, like, just thinking I had that, because I'm a psychopath or something. And then I would see a photo of me, and I was like, no. No. Yeah, like, Confidence through the roof for no reason. Oh, no, no, no. And so I, like, literally saw, and I was like, okay, work. Like, that's what I thought I had. Like, and now it actually is there. So Mm -hmm. it was just, like, perfect actually you comforting me getting uh, my hand cleaned yeah. was the craziest oh thing God. I've yeah. ever so they're seen. cutting stitches off of my nipples and I'm just like okay whatever ripping my drains out which are in like a circle oh. and it's just like like out of me yeah. and then I'm just like okay work like loves it and then I get out and then Gigi's like hands like bleeding she's like no and she's help. like to the doctor she's like I hurt my hand. Like, will you look at it? Meanwhile, like, he just finished doing. And like, he's like, this isn't my job. I've never seen anything like it. Gigi is like stoic and strong and like together. And then injury happens. All hell breaks loose. (laughs) Dealing with like in the most adorable, like endearing way, like a three-year-old child. I thought I was gonna have to get my my hand amputated. Yeah, no, and like in her brain, like Like, literally, can't tell her anything different. Like this is going to happen. Like I'm going to die. Like nothing will ever be the same. Kind of shit. Yeah. yeah, that was like one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through, I swear to God. Okay, well, now it's time to go. San Fran, we're out. We're out, San Fran. We love you so much. Love you, San Fran. Look at the flag. You're good to us. You are so good to us. All said and done, it's been almost one year since the surgery. Any advice that you would tell somebody, anything that you think that they should tell their doctors or just any words of wisdom, because you're a year in. Definitely just like voice your opinion. Or like exactly how you want it like and even if a doctor is like I don't know your chest might be too big for that type of surgery I know a lot of people whose doctors try to sway them kind of one way mm-hmm. and then it turns out gorgeous I don't know listen to your gut and just like kind of work with them because you can get your results you want for sure with that being said one year later can we see how it's looking yeah you can I feel like that's how what everyone's should like yeah. Take it off. yeah all Here. right yeah yeah of course chickadee yeah, chickadee Oh my god. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that. So crazy. Yeah, it's a moment. Some person came up to me at the club. I was like wearing this outfit that had it out and like went like this really hard and it felt interesting. Like I don't know how to describe it. It felt definitely weird. It was the first time someone was like grabbing really hard right there. But yeah, it feels great. I haven't worked on my chest like at all, so I'm like still the flattest, but I kind of like love that for me right now. Okay, so thank you guys for watching this video. Thanks, Kate, for being so open and Thanks honest. For having me. Thank you guys for doing this for me. I literally would have died without you, and I can't believe the universe put me in your lives. Yeah, babe. Yeah, Kate. I love you. <laughs> I hope this video helped you in any way, shape, or form. Send it to anybody you think that needs it, and until we see you guys next time, stay gorgeous. Second, I just embraced who I was fully and showed the world who I was fully and started living unapologetically. It changed my life and allowed me to open up in ways that I didn't even understand at the time. Hi Attitude, it is me, Gottmik, and you are watching Behind the Scenes on my Attitude Magazine cover. And it's a rap bitch. Drag means so much to me growing up. I just dabbled in so many different forms of art and when I truly found the art form of drag it was like a way to combine every single art form into one and that's what I love so much about it it's every drag queen so unique because they show what they're good at and make the world see how unique and amazing their art is growing up I had so many drag icons I was lucky I was lucky enough to be exposed to really amazing people like Lee Bowery and Divine and amazing trans women like Amanda Lepore at such a young age and I always loved just how out of the box and characteristic that they all were and it definitely inspired my drag today. I have learned so much about the power of embracing your identity. I remember before I truly was comfortable in the skin I'm in and before I truly came out and told the world who I was, even though I thought I was living my life, I was not. I The second I just embraced who I was fully and showed the world who I was fully and started living unapologetically, it changed my life and allowed me to open up in ways that I didn't even understand at the time.
for any cis person who's trying to be more supportive of the trans community or a trans person in their life that's transitioning, my best advice would just be to listen, make sure you have an open mind and you're listening to what your trans friend and the trans community is saying triggers them or what they need help with and just be there in any way you can, whether it's emotionally, physically, financially, no matter what it is, because, you know, just, it's like such little things. It doesn't have to be major surgeries, just such little things like an outfit or a binder or like a little jaw filler for me and for, you know, perhaps just little things like that have changed my entire life. So I think mean, just be open-minded and listen and be as supportive as you can. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is one of the most amazing shoots I've ever done in my life. So I am so excited for you guys to see this and get into it and be excited about it as I am. Thank you, Attitude, for having me. And I'll catch you later. Bye, Gorge. Time to crash the system. I'm Got Mick and I'm ready to kill it. My drag is inspired by fashion and designers like McQueen and Galliano. Wake up girls, it's now time to listen. Hand on your hip and assume the position. Mama Ru said that we're all born naked. Got Mick says love you but I don't fake it. Here's the tea. I put in work, baby. So fight for yourself and let all the basic haters lurk, baby. That that stands so right, clown paint and waist so tight. Boys, girls, and in between, it's time to crown your queen. Let's go. Andy Mules. It is so amazing how we represent such different communities here gay, trans, pug. <laughs> Hey, Rue, how's it going? Just let me know when the cameras are rolling and we'll kill it. Well, we've started. The cameras are rolling. Uh, uh, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> Sorry. Got Mick. Congratulations, you are the winner of this week's challenge. Congratulations, you are the winner of this week's challenge. Oh, my God. I did not just fucking win Smash Game. It's too much. Moving on to our judges. <laughs> Hi, you guys. Hi. Lonnie Love. I just cannot believe I am standing up here presenting my comedy in front of you. I knew there was going to be budget cuts this season, but I didn't know it was going to affect the judges panel, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Mm -mm -mm. Maybe the cat won't notice us, but I'm allergic to cats. Uh, uh. Oh! You gotta stop it. Relax, I'm fine. Achoo! I basically grew up with the show now, and every person I was crowned always opened my mind. The world is not black or white. It is this craziest gray area, and that's what my drag is. And I have grown so much here. I'm so ready to be crowned and be the representation that I wish I had growing up. And that's why I'm America's Next Drag Superstar. Thank you. Category is black and white. First up, Baby Got Mick. I am walking down the runway on the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race. Girl, I shaved my head for this runway. I have a custom Got Mick Pandora box. Pinhead comes out of the box to steal your soul. Well, I'm coming out of the box to steal the crown.
Hi, this is Andy Butler from Hercules and Love Affair, and I'm here with Kim Ann Foxman right there in the Jammy Jams. Um, the lead vocalist for this song, My House, Sean Wright. Aire Negrot on the left, and back here with me is Mark Pistol. And this song is My House. It's the first single off of the new album, Blue Songs. We kind of chose this to be the first single, I think, because when we were doing these songs live, people always went crazy when we played this song. It has a really Chicago house feel to it, and... Um, yeah, I mean, it's a boogie, boogie, boogie track. It's a good Saturday night track, so I hope you enjoy it. Get up, get up, come on. Get up, get up, get up, get up, go, go, go. Get up, get up, come on. Get up, get up, get up, get up, go, go, go. Get up, get up, come on. Get up, get up, get up, get up, go, go, go. Get up, get up, come on. Then my house in order, then my 